Can you domesticate a dragon? Well, we'll find out. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and today we are... Well, it's a new year, so that means it's a new series of videos and we're kicking off with a little world building for the month of January. We're going to expand our minds just a little bit and delve into the wonderful, wonderful world of creating something out of nothing. Now, I love world building, so I hope that you're going to find some kind of enjoyment out of today's video. Now, we're asking, can you domesticate a dragon? And I'll reveal the answer to you at the end of the show, although I suspect you may already guess it. Before we get into it, hit that like button, if for only the reason that you like to press stuff on your computer whilst you're watching to something. And if you're just listening to this, well, bully for you. Listen on, but hit that like button. Anyway, now, let us, let us consider. Let us consider. Consider the lilies. If you get that reference, 50 experience points to you. Aha! On that subject, we've decided that throughout this video and all the videos moving forward, you are going to earn experience points by watching these videos, by absorbing the information and by learning and by growing from it, which also means I'm not going to just give you XP at the end of the video. I'm going to give you XP throughout the video. So you have to uh, kind of work your way through to see how much XP you get. And then at the end of the video, list how much XP you manage to find in the video. It's hidden all over the place like good XP should be. Can you domesticate a dragon? That's the question we're asking today, and how do we even begin to answer that question? As world builders, it is something that's going to have to come up. You have to think about what has your world domesticated. Our own world, for example, we have only a handful of animals out of the thousands of potential animals out there that are domesticated. The question is, why? Well, there was a book written by a I was going to say by a friend of mine. Yes, she's a very good friend, actually. There was a book written by a gentleman by the name of Jared Diamond. And Jared Diamond is one of my favorite authors, very influential author in my life, and certainly in terms of my world building. And he wrote a book called Guns, Germs and Steel, which talks specifically about domesticable species. That's a fun word to say out loud. Say it with me. Domesticable domesticable. It's one of those words which if you don't think about it, you can end up getting a little bit tongue-tied. Nonetheless, Jared Diamond wrote that there are five or six traits that an animal has to possess in order to be domesticable. Those traits are in no particular order, but I'm going to refresh your memory in case you haven't read that massive tome. So the first one is that they need to be able to grow and mature quickly. They need to take a short amount of time to get to being as big as possible. We have bred species all over this planet based primarily on this premise. We want sheep that are bigger, fatter, stronger, give more wool. We want cows that are bigger, fatter and stronger or give more milk. And that's why we have specific milk cows versus, say, other kinds of cows that we use just for beef or what we use for this, we use for that. These animals need to grow up in the shortest space of time possible. Now, when you think about a human, a human takes a very long time to grow up. On average, the human is really only fully capable in on, of themselves from around the end of puberty, although from the beginning of the puberty, you could argue, in the 1300s, the 1500s, the early years, people as young as 10 or 11 were inheriting the throne and running countries and estates and things, so responsibility has nothing to do with it. It's about maturity. When do you reach maturity? So something that's got a very short growth period is absolutely vital. Breeding in captivity, or at least breeding in confined spaces, is absolutely important. This is the second trait that these animals have to have. So, for example, pandas. Pandas are not notoriously embarrassed and very, very shy creatures when it comes to reproducing within the confines of some kind of breeding facility or a zoo. They hate to do it. They absolutely do. However, in the wild, they kind of do okay. Well, even then, it's not entirely true. Their dating strategy is all wrong. It's all about sending selfies, and that just doesn't work these days. It's about, it's about the personality. Anyway, pandas don't do it very well. However, bunnies do. Rabbits breed like, well, rabbits, and that's why we eat them. Um, or, you know, look at them and say, aren't they cute until they've 
bred 50,000 of them and have eaten most of your uh, continent. I'm looking at you, Australia. Now, um, rabbits breed very well. Cows breed very well. They don't really care. Chickens really, really don't care who's watching. They will breed anywhere. So our species needs to be able to breed really easily. Then thirdly, they need to be able to eat food that is easily obtainable. In other words, if, let's say, for example, cows preferred not to eat grass or anything else that was green, but let's say, for example, they only preferred to eat lobster, we would have a lot less beef burgers in our chain stores these days. We would have a lot less cow everywhere, and leather would become a precious commodity as opposed to something that is an expensive commodity, but it's, it's not as, as precious as, say, lobster, for example. So it has to be able to eat something that we can get easily, we can store easily, and then we can sort of distribute fairly easily as well. Again, you kind of look at certain species and you go, you're just too picky. You really are too picky. As humans, we are quite picky sometimes. Sometimes we can just sort of eat anything and everything, and, and, and I appreciate those kind of people. Um, others, you know, will only eat certain types of burgers or whatever. So they have to be able to eat something that is readily, readily available and fairly inexpensive. Uh, to acquire or to purchase. Then they need to be hardy. I cannot say this enough. A fragile, frail little thing that can only grow in a very specific environment is not going to help you. It really isn't going to help you. You want something that will last the course, that will stay the course. And you could arguably say, well, Elephants. Elephants are pretty good at staying the course. They can survive in fairly arid environments. We know this from the desert elephants of the of Namibia, uh, of the Namib desert, desert elephants. We know that they can survive in pretty cold environments. Hannibal marched his over the Alps uh, to invade the Romans. And we know that, generally speaking, they'll survive in wet environments, such as the Indian elephants, or in sort of more semi-arid environments, such as the plains of Africa. There is a big problem, though, is that a herd of elephant will strip an entire area bare and turn it into a desert, as happened in Botswana in Chobe National Elephant Park. Unfortunately, they stripped the entire place bare and then all starved to death. So they were hardy, but they just ate too much. So hardy is important but not at the expense of other things. The animals also then need to be able to live in herds or packs. They need to be social creatures. Ha ha, you say, but what about the cat? Well, a cat is still a sociable creature, whether it likes to admit it or not, as generally speaking, they will get together from time to time. Now, of course, the lion is a an exceptional cat in this sense. It has a pride. They're so proud that they actually get together as a group. They call themselves a pride. I mean, I think that's a little bit you know, personally um, ambitious, but nonetheless, they get together in prides, whereas most of the other big cats tend to stay on their own. Again, this is more of a function of what they eat and the amount of stuff that they eat rather than them not particularly liking to get together. When leopards get together, for example, they'll forget to do anything else except for, well, breed, really. But anyway, that's not the point. So they need to be able to be sociable. Cows stick together, horses stick together, generally speaking, except for that one bitter old mule. But he's a bit of an ass, and so we move on. Donkey, donkey, donkey. Uh, yes, I'm in a very good mood today, in case you hadn't noticed, because it's a new year and we get to build a world and do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Okay, so for 150 experience points, the last thing that animals need to have when they are being domesticated is that they need to be, wait for it, non-aggressive. Yes, that's absolutely right. There is a reason why we have domesticated certain types of buffalo, which are more like cattle, more like cows than actual buffalo or bison. That's because the standard African bison buffalo, got that wrong, Big build up, got it wrong. You know what? It's live. No, it's not. But it's kind of live because I'm talking to you. We're having a conversation. Don't judge me. Look, I mean, it's me, right? So the, the African buffalo, let me get this right now. I'm trying to make a point here. The African buffalo. We can't domesticate that little buffalo because when they are cornered when they are herded together the african buffalo will charge and try to gore and maul the thing that is cornering it whereas the average cow won't it will just stand there looking at you in a very dumb kind of way i grew up on a dairy farm so i can tell you they are dumb creatures i had so many conversations with them where i felt like i was literally speaking a different language nonetheless so 
Buffalo are very, very, very angry animals. Rhinoceros are angry as well. They grow pretty big, but they charge when threatened. They don't just back down. They're aggressive animals, generally speaking. The same with, for example, tigers. Tigers are not known to herd together and shy away from combat. Green mambas do exactly the same. For a snake, it's a particularly aggressive snake, as is the black mamba. The mamba family are really just an angry, angry, angry uh, bunch of asps, if you ask me. So they need to be able to be clustered together in a non-aggressive way. Those are the traits. So let's see, does a dragon comply? Can we domesticate the standard dragon using the parameters that Jared set down? The first one, they need to reach maturity quickly. Well, dragons by most law take about a hundred years to get to the point where they're adult dragons and then they're still not as big as they could be. We want them to go for several hundred years before they get to full magnificent size. So that's one failure. Can't domesticate them based on that. But there are five other things we could maybe possibly win on. So for 50 experience points, they um, breed easily. From what I've heard, they do kind of breed quite easily. They do lay eggs, clutches of eggs. So that could be useful. Hens lay eggs. We like hens and ducks and geese. So that could be a benefit. But, uh, well, those eggs generally take a very long time to incubate and require lots of protection. And sometimes they require certain magic in order to actually hatch. And so I'm going to say breeding is not easy. So that's two down already. Still four to go. Are they hardy? Can they survive? Yes. Yes, they definitely can. Dragons can survive in almost any kind of environment, given the uh, option to adapt. And a lot of the older dragons will actually adapt their own environments anyway, using magic to warp the local terrain and stuff. So, yes, absolutely, dragons are hardy. Yes, one up, two down. Okay. Do they live in herds? Well, I hope not. Um, no, dragons, generally speaking, are assumed to be non-herd-like. There are, to the best of my knowledge, very few reptiles that herd, that kind of get together. Uh, now, I'm not talking about alligators that just fill up a swamp. They're not really a herd. They're kind of individual. They don't really work together as a pack, although some do, yes. Sure, the garls of the Indian uh, subcontinent don't necessarily work together in packs crocodiles don't care one way or another nonetheless reptiles generally kind of avoid the whole pack thing and i think dragons are exactly the same they're fairly solitary things they, they, they some like to be social so i'm gonna i'm gonna err on the side of going no i'm gonna say no i'm gonna say no on that one i'm just gonna say it I'm just gonna say it i'm just gonna say it no on that one so Easily obtainable food. Do they eat easily obtainable food? Well, let's see. They eat herds of cattle or adventurers. So you could put up a sign saying adventurers wanted to slay fearsome dragon. And then the dragon will eat those adventurers. But I think after a while, the adventurers get, get wise and kind of go, no. So I'm going to say that their food is not easily, be easily obtainable unless you are already a dragon. In which case... You wouldn't really be domesticating other dragons because that would be a whole master-slave relationship thing. And that doesn't really... Maybe that will help the breeding. I don't know. I don't judge. So, on the whole, we get to the last question. Are dragons non-aggressive when confronted? And the answer is, I think we should just stick with cows. So, yes, dragons are definitely, definitely aggressive when they are confronted. So that rules them completely out. One out of six, I'd say. Maybe you could argue two out of six. Either way, dragons are not domesticable. Now, you might sit back and go, well, that was a waste of my time. Thanks. It was, you know, 14 minutes I'll never get back. Actually, no. Why? Because we need to run these thought experiments in our heads when we are thinking about these kinds of things. We need to sit back and say, well, okay, maybe the dragon, we need to adjust the dragons in our world to make them fit, to make them comply with the Diamond Six rules. So maybe we need to change dragons to being more like horses. Horses work together. Horses are really good. They really 
oftentimes seem to enjoy having someone riding on their back. They, 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 they don't really attack. So maybe if we make our dragons more equine, and so that they maybe feast on something like, I don't know, grass, which is a pretty common thing for animals to eat. But let's say that the dragons eat grass, but they eat a particular type of grass. It has to be easily obtainable, remember, otherwise it's just too costly to do it. Maybe they eat some kind of grass or there's some kind of mushroom that they eat in a certain cave. So they are still herbivorous and they're not particularly aggressive. They need to be trained to be ridden into battle. So they behave more like horses that can fly, which kind of gets us to Pegasi. Didn't mean to rhyme there, but I did. Maybe they kind of like scaly Pegasus. Pegasi is better. So there's a whole bunch of things that we can think about when we start asking these questions. And it might be a ridiculous question to begin with. But if you want to have dragon riders in your world and you want those dragons to feel like it makes sense, well, this is one of the ways of doing it. The alternative, which has been presented in a kids series in the 1980s of all things, was dino riders, where the dinosaurs were telepathically submissive to the uh, good folk or they were mentally controlled by the evil folk to being submissive and to complying with these six rules. So maybe your dragons are mind controlled into submitting and the moment that mind control is lost, the dragon suddenly is free and it goes back to its normal routine of eating the rider. Just something to think about. So these thought experiments are really, really powerful. Now, what are we gonna do with all of this created dragon stuff? We're going to put it into World Anvil. Now, World Anvil is today's sponsor, so that's why I'm mentioning them. But even so, even if they weren't the sponsor, we would still need to store this information somewhere. We would need to create this law, and I cannot think of a better place than World Anvil. World Anvil is a world aggregator. It allows you to create your world. You can load in all of your maps, and then it's got a whole lot of templates that are really going to help you in terms of creating this creature that you have now domesticated for your world, keeping track of it, loading up images of it, sharing bits of information with your players. It's all there in World Anvil. Check it out. Use the code GREATGM and get a discount if you want to sign up for a subscription, which you don't have to do, by the way. It is free to use. Obviously, some features are locked behind a subscription wall, but hey, that's business. Big thank you to World Anvil. Now, if you have been watching this video, your task for today is to create a domesticated animal and share it with us down below. Let's have a whole menagerie of domesticated animals or creatures that you have drawn from your fantasy world or from a monster's manual or from wherever you might want to draw your inspiration, create it and list why it is domesticable rather than, well, we wouldn't keep this because crocodiles make awesomely bad herd animals, right? They're really difficult to feed or they're really this, or they're slow to breed or they're slow to get to maturity or whatever. List it down below. Let's have a menagerie of domesticated animals so we can all draw from it and share and grow as a result. And that will also earn you 250 experience points, by the way. So I hope you've been keeping track of all of the experience points because we're now at the end of the video. And so you have earned what you have earned. What can you do with these experience points? Well, you can pat yourself on the back and keep track because over the next year, we're going to be building those experience points to the point that hopefully you will have a score high enough to claim that you are truly a great GM. Until next time, a massive, 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 massive thank you to all of my wonderful Patreons whose names are scrolling up on one of the sides of the screens I can never remember. A massive thank you to you for watching all the way to the end. And if you really enjoyed today's video, hit that like button. And if you're not a subscriber of the channel yet, hit the subscribe button because for the next year we're going to be learning and growing together as we change the way we run our games and our GMs forever. Until then, however, I wish you and yours the happiest of gaming.